Yeah, Real Sounds of Africa there to once again kick off our World Football phone-in. So we're talking football in Europe and South America this morning and players from over there playing in our leagues. The Colonels here, Mina Rizuki, good morning. Ah, good morning. Hello. How are you? You are right? No, no, you don't understand what happened to me. I had one of those nights, you know. So, but I'm, I'm here. I had to take a taxi to make sure I'm here on time after I got a punctured tie and had to leave my car in the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And? But I made it. Yeah. Aren't you impressed? Uh, Tim Vickery, can you, can you hear the excuses Amina's making? This is World Football phone She started off making excuses. <laughs> We can't have that, can Don't we? Don't worry about it. She'll, she'll tell us all about it on Instagram later on, as I've, as I've recently discovered. What is Instagram? What is Instagram? You're, Tim, you don't yeah, like any of my the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> younger generation, that includes me. So, how comes I don't know about it? Yeah, Basically, yeah, well, it's on that big anyway. thing called a, a smartphone. What is a smartphone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's not as smart as I am. Anyway. Nothing uh, is. Yeah. Well, I can make a call, you know. Never mind take photographs. I just want a call. I know how to make a call. Those smartphones. Anyway, let's leave that to one side. It is one big story tonight, as you both know, yeah? No, what happened? Well, I okay, think yeah, I'm coming on there's to one that. Biggest, there's an even bigger story. <laughs> yeah, and the even on. bigger Which story is, is that we're all alive. This is true. No, That's isn't a big that one. great? Uh, unexpected. Yeah, well, no, you've become really new age since I've gone, huh? It, it's, well, it's so good hearing the real sounds of Africa, and, it, and it's not telling us that you know everything's all right with the world, but it is yeah. telling us that everything's a little less scary than it was this time last week. Yeah. Well, the big story tonight is that um, I've got a, a ticket for uh, Tottenham versus Manchester United at Wembley, and uh, a VIP one as well. So we may as well just Ooh, talk about that for the next couple of hours. For, forget it. They're not going to let you in because they're going to do the search and they're going to find chocolate biscuits on your person. And they're yeah, going to say, right. look, you're going to, you're, yeah, gentlemen, right. you're, you're going to an area of the ground where you can only have prawn cocktails well, funny and you're enough, lightened up with chocolate biscuits. Funny enough, that we're going to, I'm going to an area of the ground where they don't allow team colours. So I won't be able to bring in my Charlton colours. <laughs> You really love Charlton, don't you? Yeah, I do. Of course I do. Anyway, let's talk about the other big story, which is uh, Arsene Wenger. Yes, what indeed. Arsene Wenger, after 22 years. It's phenomenal when you think about it. finally chucked out. Well, mm -hmm. has he been chucked out, Mina? What do you know that we don't know? Well, I don't know. I mean, according to what I've, I heard, it wasn't that he was chucked out. It's that it was kind of like listen, dude, you know, like, let's come to an agreement. We know you're not getting any younger. We're not getting the results, you know, that kind of like a mutual thing, right? Where he's chosen, I believe, to probably say it's better for me to walk away right now than suffer any type of, you know, bad thing happening. But th that's just the people I work with who told me that. So I don't, I, it wasn't from a club or anything like that. So well, I don't know. Does it make a difference whether he was pushed out or whether he fell on his sword, for want of a better phrase, and decided that, to hang his hat up now. Does it make any difference for you, Mina? No, not really. I think that it's quite nice that they've allowed him to do it on his own terms, to be honest. Um, I, Yeah, no, it doesn't make a difference, to be honest. Tim, in South America, is this news at all in South America? Of course it is. Huge news, and for two reasons. One is that the Premier League is very, very popular over here. Uh, and the other is uh, that, that they just don't have coaches lasting for anything. like. And you don't have that in England anymore. Um, no. But, you know, here in South America, I think just by chance, I was on TV on Thursday, and one of the things we were talking about is which coach is the longest one in, uh, you know, has been longest. In Brazilian First Division, which one has been in, in the job longest? And the presenter said, yeah, as soon as we say that, he, he's all, that, that always means he's automatically sacked the week afterwards. And you won't find anyone with two years, you know. So, and 22 years, it is extraordinary. I and mean, you think 22 years ago, there was no Instagram 22 years ago. I don't know what Mina Rizuki did with her time 20, 22 really years ago. Do you know, it but, takes me like, do you know, I only, up, you know, I'm supposed to upload every day according to, yeah, anyway. But I only upload once a month and then I get just got loads of ha like hassle for it because... I'm just not somebody who does that. I get really into it for like a day and then I'll start doing all sorts of things and then I'll just get really bored. But how long is I got into it for, for a day when I realised I could do photos of, of Didier Dogba and people like that. But anyway, <laughs> back to Arsene Wenger, which I think is, 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 is what we're here for. Uh, the, 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 I think perhaps his achievement here 
you know, on this side of the Atlantic, perhaps isn't isn't appreciated um, in its fullness because you know back in 1996 there, there, there really wasn't any Premier League football here, and they didn't really know what it what, what it what they didn't know a great deal about it. And the the, the great achievement for for me of of of, of Arsene Wenger is he, he, that he's changed the identity of the club, and it's changed forever. And if and we don't, we're old enough to remember what Arsenal were. You know, they were they, there were certain values in that institution. I think in in Fever Pitch, Nick Hornby uh, sums it up wonderfully with that moment in the 1980 FA Cup final, which is the first time I ever got drunk. By the way, the 1980 FA Cup final. Uh, what year? When seven, uh, 1980. I was. Uh, what was the first time you got 50. drunk? Yeah, I got I got hopelessly steamingly drunk and went home and my dad just saw me in a terrible state throwing up all over all, all over the place. I never got drunk in front of him again. But anyway, Paul Allen, 17-year-old West Ham forward is through on goal and Willie Young hauls him down, drags him down. You know, you didn't get a red card for it in those days. It was only a booking. And Nick Hornby said, you know, it was such an Arsenal thing yeah, to do. Of course, do. yeah. Uh, they were hard and, nuts. And it's not anymore. Yeah. You know, the the the, the uh, uh, Wenger has associated Arsenal Arsenal with very different things now. You know, people all around the world associate Arsenal not with Willie Young uh, fouling 17-year-old Paul Allen when he when he's straight through on goal. But they have other associations, more romantic associations uh, with. Uh, I mean, and Arsenal for me is like David Price. I and mean, people probably won't remember David Price, but he was uh, he was uh, the kind of limited but you know hard running midfielder who just seen Arsenal seem to clone him you know there were, there were lots of David Price figures and that's what David Arsenal Platt. were there were so David many of them Brian Talbot was, yeah. uh, was was another one there David Hillier that that, that kind of player it and, sounds like you know, you're really disappointed uh, disappointed that he's go. gone yeah no 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 I'm not because uh uh you know, it probably went on too long. I, I don't know. This is something that, that it, it would be great to get your opinion on. I don't know if what's happened to him in recent in recent years has how much of that has to do with the club and whether the club's priorities have changed and and, and whether they're, they're, they've been run in recent years more of a business than as a football club that are that, that are chasing titles. And I, I don't really know that. But it, it's a it's a colossal achievement to to take an institution that had certain associations and to rebrand it in such a way that all it's it's now a global player with 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 uh, other um, with other identifications. You know, when people now when they think of Arsenal, they think of Thierry Henry and 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 and, and Flair and so on. They never used to think of that in terms of Arsenal. So that, that I think is a is a colossal achievement, and I hope that the lack of success over, over the last decade or so doesn't detract from a massive achievement. Let's take a couple of quarters, and we will get your thoughts on this as well, Mina, but Mark in Devon is with us. Hello, Mark. Hello. How Hello. are you? I'm very well, thanks very much. You've got a question for Mina, I suppose. Go ahead. Yeah, um, what do you think the legacy will be left behind by Arsene Wenger? Oh, Wow. It's huge, to be honest, the, the the legacy for the style of football, the way that he, the Invincibles is probably what we'll remember the most from what he gave football, the, the sort of professionalism within it, how he changed the diets of the players, how he was involved in every aspect of the club, what he built, what he made, how professional he made the footballers, his eye for talent, his ability to nurture players and ensure that they thrive. Um, okay, there is probably... It was really funny, actually, because I was doing this way, the TV show and they were asking me whether I thought Manchester City was the greatest Premier League side that we've seen. And this is before Liverpool smashed them. And, and I said, I, I wouldn't know, because I feel like at the time when Arsenal went that season you know, undefeated, and they were the Invincibles. There, is, there was no question about it. There was no team on earth that they wouldn't be able to get a result against. They were truly a fantastic and solid side and capable in both phases of the game, capable up front, capable at the back. The way they used the pitch, their attitude, their strength, you, you never needed to say, oh, I'm not sure if they're not tested or I'm not. They just managed it. But with Manchester City, there was always that, what we don't really know is, is the strength of the Premier League this strong this season? Do they have, like, real competition? 
And I just think for Arsenal, that's his legacy. He created the the, the undefeated side, one, the one that we will remember forever. And I feel like that's what his bread and butter and what he lived on. And just really for being the guy that made the Premier League interesting. I'm For me, what I obviously grew up to Serie A because the time that I was growing up, that was the league to really watch as well. Not not just because of anything. It was genuinely just the league to watch. It was the league of Van Basten and Rijkaard and Rijkaard being my favorite, you know, one of my favorite ever players. But he, Arsenal made the Premier League very interesting for me. His, the, the way that he went up against Manchester United, gave us a real test to see, you know, who was going to be the best club. Vieira versus Roy Keane, tactics versus, you know, solidity. It was his schemes, his technique, his the way that he made football is just so much more than just hard men, but men who ate the right way, men who trained the right way. There is so much, but really after 2007, I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps he just lasted too long, so we forget sometimes. Until obviously today, when we'll remember the good times. You haven't even mentioned the overcoats. Yeah, the the the, the puffer, you know, the puffer jacket was something of, a, of of something we'll always remember. But I just, yeah, I guess that, and also just the way that he spoke. I feel like you know. I, I know this well, sounds crazy, spoke, but I'll spoke, always... He spoke better English than most of us, is what you're trying to say, is it? No, I just love his little, like, um, how, you know, people used to pick on him, like Jose Mourinho, and the way that he was responding. I always loved the fact that he was a gentleman. And, you know, I just... This was one of the reasons why I wasn't a fan of Antonio Conte being in charge of my team. Um, that, that's why I'm... I'm it's it's really strange. I always want a Roy Keane on the on the pitch, but I never want a Roy Keane on the bench. Does that make sense? Makes and for sense. me, Wenger just is class and elegance, and I'd always be really proud if that was my coach. Yeah, Mark, thanks a lot for the question. Although I thought the question that you wanted to ask Mina was, who's going to take over from Arsene Wenger, Mina? Brendan Rodgers. There is an Italian in the frame, of course. Uh, the Ancelotti. Juventus. No, well, two Italians, actually. I was thinking of the Juventus manager. Max Allegri. Well. Max yeah. Allegri won't come yeah. now. He won't come. Um, I don't think so. Why, um, why? He's one of the front runners, yeah, apparently. But they've always linked him to the Arsenal job, but um, we're fairly certain that he's going to stay at Juventus. What he started there is something that I really feel like he wants to finish, largely because, obviously, of the way that Juventus were chucked out of the Champions League. Mm -hmm. He knows that investments will be made over the summer, yeah. and I think that he's really he signed a new contract, so so I know that he's going to be probably going to be there for a while. Never say never. It's every chance. Cool. You know that I, I'm a huge fan of his. I don't necessarily think he's the right choice, though, weirdly enough, despite the fact that I think he's one of the best coaches in the world. I know that I think that Brendan Rodgers is somebody that's, you know, a front runner, let's yeah. say that much. I don't I know that a lot of people hate him. I don't know why. I thought that he did a very good job at, at Liverpool, but he Arsenal is, is... did a better job at Swansea before Liverpool as well. But John in Salford, interestingly enough... He also wanted to mention, Mina, that he's afraid that you're going to give him a one of your famous tongue lashings. I didn't even oh. know that they were famous. <laughs> anyway, he says uh, he's afraid of being subjected to one of Mina's famous tongue lashings if he were to suggest that Buffon overstepped the mark in his rough treatment of the English referee Michael Oliver. Anyway, but he wants he me. But he wants me to ask Tim Vickery whether Tim thinks that Maurizio Pochettino should throw his hat in the ring for the Arsenal job. <gasps> oh. oh, he's the best coach yeah, in the league. Do that. Yeah, and you can't do that. And and that's that's one reason I think Allegri wouldn't wouldn't want the Arsenal job. That uh, you know he'll be he'll be a bit scared about the local competition. You know, after his team were 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 so comprehensively outclassed in those two Champions League games, but just managed yeah, to sneak won. a victory based on based on experience. <laughs> no, uh, based on so, good tactics. You know, he'd, 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 <laughs> and, be, he'd, and, he'd and, be a little bit worried about that, I think. No, no, no. I I think you need to accept that Pochettino dropped the ball there. I'm a big fan of Pot. Uh, you know, I think he's the best coach in the league. I think he's better than anything, you know. But he dropped the ball against Juventus and I was really upset because I thought he was like, there was just this part of him where I'm like, come on, you have to react to the substitutions. You have to make your decisions quicker. And he took that bit longer and by then it was too late. Juventus had already scored two goals. So it was so late and then you could see his frustration and then what he said afterwards in the, in the, to the press was a little bit bitter. It was kind of disappointing from Podge. I still love him. I'll always welcome him in my team. But he dropped the ball.
You see, this is what, what we're on, Buffon. While mm. we're on Buffon, there, a, mm. a story has emerged about oh. Buffon going to Argentina. Uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, that Boca Juniors. And this story suddenly spread on Sunday night on Argentine TV. It was based on the friendship with, with Carlos Tevez. You know, Buffon retires uh, at the end of this season and then or it retires from Juventus and then maybe coming across to, to play a, 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 a few months with, with Boca Juniors, a kind of late career South American adventure. And, and Buffon's agent immediately said, no, I, I haven't heard anything about it. Well, we've just had some news in the last few hours. There'll be a meeting, apparently. They have spoken. Um, Boca's president has spoken directly to, to Buffon. And there's a meeting on May the 17th between them. Between so, them? Uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah, be, yeah I wouldn't be that shocked, you know. Buffon and, and Angelici are going to talk. I, Is, I wouldn't be that surprised. I, I'm really delighted that our editor tonight has now recharged my batteries with... Mm, mm, um, a cookie. Are you eating? Oh. No, I'm not eating. I'm, I'm just not allowed admiring. to drink water. I'm just admiring. <laughs> I'm not eating. I'm just admiring the cookie that he's handed me. Anyway, never mind us talking about Arsene Wenger. We really need to get the thoughts of Cleo in all the shot, who's our number Wait. one gooner. Mm. Hello, Cleo. But you didn't let me. You didn't let me off. Oh, hang on, Cleo. I've interrupted uh, Her Majesty the Colonel. Sorry. It's okay. I'll defend Buffon afterwards. Go don't on. worry. Can't. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. But Cleo, what was your reaction to Arsene Wenger deciding to um, end his time at Arsenal at the end of the season? I'm not surprised. He was due to go next year because he had a two-year contract when he won the FA Cup last year. But he's, he's 69 in October. I wouldn't want all that hassle at, at his age. There's been a lot of, I'm going to say backstabbing, but a lot of fans have protested by not turning up to matches. There have been a lot of empty seats at the Emirates. But I get an email saying there's spare tickets going for the Stoke match or whatever. I know that something's desperately wrong. They're looking at the merchandising and, and the carry-on from uh, uh, for the team. But he has been a great, great uh, boss for us. Seven... FA Cups, three league titles, a couple of years in the late 90s when he won the double, you know, back to back. He's been excellent for us. We had a doldrum days back in the 70s, early 80s, even with George Graham there. We didn't reach our full potential, but Wenger brought so much to the game. The nutrition, as Mina has said, his tactics followed all over the world. And on the, on the Arsenal website is Merci Wenger. I mean, that says it all. Thank you. We've got so much to thank him for. There's a lot of fans out there with short memories, but he is been one of the greatest for us. And it's our follow-on. And as I say, the, who's going to take over? There's been talk of uh, Patrick Vieira. He's over in America at the moment. Um, Herr Lowe of Germany. He's been mentioned in the Who frame several like? times. Who would you like to take over? Yeah, I would like. Well, I'd love Patrick Vieira to take over. Why? Why? An uh, old know? player, and can galvanise the players and show them what it was used to be like. And a younger man, of course. But, but does he have enough experience? Of, well, that's the other thing I put on the Facebook site. I, I urge everybody to join our World Football Facebook page, and we just. Just excellent people can, uh, you know, put in on their opinions. I don't think he's got enough. But he's, if he goes hand in hand uh, with Steve, let's say, at the moment, maybe something. I mean, people usually look to the deputy to take over, uh, you know, as a big club, CEOs and whatever. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. But Tim, but my question Tim. for Tim was... Yeah, go on. you got a question. Go ahead. But to, Tim, does he think it's to the benefit of Argentina that Messi and Aguero are sadly out of the Champions League. Oh, for, for Messi, there's not the slightest doubt. I mean, the Argentina coach, Sampaoli, he must have been turning cartwheels. I mean, he, he said uh, at the start of the year, he, he went on a little European tour and he met all of his players and obviously the first one is Messi. In fact, he's just going again. He's, he's doing the same thing again. But he said in January, look, we, we really need to avoid what happened four years ago in Brazil when Messi turned up to the World Cup absolutely exhausted. And he did. I mean, I was in the stadium for some of Argentina's games and uh, 
he, he kind of spent a lot of the time wandering around the centre circle with his head bowed as if he just, you know, dropped his wedding ring or something. Uh, and, you know, he could only, obviously, only ration himself to little bursts. Uh, and uh, for a team like Argentina, which at the moment are very, very deficient on organisation, and they've got to have the star shining. Otherwise, they've got no chance whatsoever. So Sampaoli said in January, please, you know, we, we need to, 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 uh, to ensure that Messi arrives at the World Cup with, with some gas still left in the tank. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, the club season doesn't really, doesn't really cooperate with that. But out of the Champions League early for the, for the, the third consecutive year that Barcelona have failed to make the semi-finals and with the Spanish league title more or less sewn up, they don't need that, that much more in order to, to, to win La Liga. It, it should ensure that uh, Messi's, at almost certainly his last World Cup and certainly his last at his peak, it should ensure that he's got some gas in the tank. In the case of Aguero, the same thing would apply were it not for this knee injury and this knee surgery, which is very, very unfortunate. We'll, we'll have to see if, if this does, does work as a benefit, if it does mean that he arrives uh, a little bit rested, or if yet again... It means that, that he turns up for a tournament, not 100%. Only two people have scored more goals for Argentina than, than Aguero. And that's Messi and Batistuta. But he's never really done it in the tournaments. And it's always been for the same reason. That come the end of the season, he, he's just not, he's, you know, he's, he's just dragging his, his weary little carcass around the, um, around the pitch. This again, like with Messi, it's his last one. I think it's his, uh, and, and it will be great to see the two of them operate together because when they are operating together and really flying, it can be great. Um, but uh, with Messi, I'm very, very optimistic. With Aguero, a little bit less so. Uh, but I think it's not only Argentina who are the winners with uh, Messi dropping out of the Champions League early. It's also the World Cup because, uh, you know, you, you really want the best players to shine. And the bane of recent World Cups has been end of, end of season burnout. So at least the biggest star should, uh, should still have some gas in the tank. Got loads of Texas. I... Sorry, go on, Melina. Well, can I just say something? I mean, imagine he'd won the Champions League. Wouldn't the adrenaline and the, the, the happiness provide something extra in what his performances might be? Perhaps. Perhaps. But the body can only take so much. Uh, and I think far, far better for, for Argentina in getting a rest than, uh, than, it, than in being burnt out. Because we, we've seen it the other way. You know, we've seen him going to World Cups on, on the back of, uh, of exhausting club seasons. And it, and it, it hasn't worked. So I think far, far better to, to, uh, to have more of a rest. In that case, Higuain is also resting too for them. Indeed, yes. And Higuain is, is the big beneficiary of the problem with, uh, with Aguero. And Higuain, Higuain is absolutely desperate for a shot at redemption. Uh, you know, because he's the man, three finals in three years for Argentina, who haven't won a senior title since 1993. And all of those three finals, he missed, he missed big chances. And he is just obsessed with the idea of redemption. He's posting on social media lyrics from songs that are all about the great <laughs> comeback and something. Um, but as, it's, as it stands, I think Aguero would, if, if they're all fit, Aguero, I think, is first choice. Uh, can you name one of those songs? Can you name one of those songs? I can name one of the songs that he loves. <laughs> I can tell you, when, when he was at Real Madrid, his favourite song was called The Climb by Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Oh, right, okay. Yeah. okay. It's just it's a really cheesy that? song. Has anybody got that? Is it called The Climb? Yeah. The Climb. I think it's, it's an Argentine song. The, the one he posted, the lyrics, is a, is a oh, song okay. from Argentina. It's an Argentine. So right, it's, but, uh, but let's see if we can not, get The Climb. Cyrus. Yeah, the Climb is the one, this one the about, climb. like, you know, like, oh, fighting, to, you know, something yeah. about your dreams, basically. Or, or S Club 7, Reach for the Stars, we can go for that as well tonight. <laughs> Listen, um, there's a couple of things, and thank you for the call, by the way, Cleo. There's a couple of things, loads and loads of texts, OK? 85058's our text number. You can email up all night at bbc.co.uk. I would love some more calls as well, please, on 0808. Five nine zero nine six nine three. So we're talking about European football and we're talking about South American football. Uh, Mina Rizuki, our colonel, is here to represent the European side. The legend, you know, Tim Vickery, uh, takes your questions on South America. Uh, I will go through all those texts and I wondered if you could ponder on a very brief question for me, just off the back of what Cleo was saying. We're not just talking about Arsene Wenger tonight, but obviously um, when his retirement or at least his um, resignation from the Arsenal uh, football team uh, comes on the night that we're doing a World Football Phone and we've got to focus on somebody like that. But something that um, that Cleo said, she said that she wanted Patrick Vieira to come in mm. and to sort of show the younger ones what the club 
was like, what the club, but it's not like what it was like when he was there anymore. These things have moved on. And I just wonder. No, I can. No, I think that has a huge difference when you have somebody who understands the club's philosophy and their ethos and their mode of, of, you know, how they work and trying to reinstill what it means to be an Arsenal player. I think that a lot of those, what you look at now in that team, I, I feel like they don't know that this is Arsenal anymore. It's about reigniting that passion and making sure that they know what shirt that they're wearing. So what I does think that, that is... say about Arsene Wenger's tenure then, when it all went wrong? Because he was supposed to be doing that, showing them what I agree. that shirt means. I... What does that say about him? Well, that and also the fact that he didn't really employ that many people that really remember that. It would have been better had he created a kind of sort of like, let's bring in, you know, past players to work with me and to help with that. And I guess that, you know, he wanted so much control that it was really hard to tell him where he was going wrong and to try to perhaps help him out in that. He just wanted to preside over everything. And I think that is his downfall in the end. Yeah, uh, Tim, uh, is it ever advisable to return to an old flame? Um, I'm talking ooh. about Sir Patrick Vieira <laughs> going back to Arsenal as as coach. Oh, no, no, as a coach, I, right? I, I, as a I, I, I agree with the, with Mina's thing about about the collective identity. I mean, the the, uh, the Juventus Tottenham thing, I think, is, is a perfect example of that. You know, Juventus have moved stadium and so on, but they 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 are Juventus, uh, and there are certain values, and those values are passed on from from the leaders of the squad to the newcomers of the squad. And so on, uh, and uh, and and someone like like Vieira, who who knows exactly what what uh, what Arsenal, the modern Arsenal, aspire to. Uh, I, I think he, he he does embody those values. I've heard very promising things about about him as a coach. Uh, you wonder if this one may have come a little bit too soon for him, but you know sometimes the the, the best solutions are the boldest ones. Uh, bonjour, this is uh, Arsene Wenger. Uh, I have uh, brought along my guitar today to play you a little song. Je t'aime, Arsenal. Je t'aime. <laughs> Moi non plus. That is our tribute to always, Arsene Wenger. I always wanted Chaz and Dave to do that. I always think Chaz and Dave doing a version of Je t'aime. Maybe, the, plus. maybe they will now. Maybe they will now. Um, and also, that tribute is meant with all due respect to Arsene Wenger, OK? Um, 0808 is talking football in Europe and South America uh, with Mina Rizuki, the colonel, with Tim Vickery, the legendino, on opposite sides of the Atlantic. And, of course, we're taking in a lot of questions about Arsene Wenger uh, resigning from the Arsenal job. Now, Daniel, in Louisville, um, or is it Louisville? Is it Louis? Yes, Louisville. Tim, wait, hang on, before you say it, Daniel, uh, Tim, is it Louisville or Louisville? Louisville. Uh, no, well, I'll come on to you, Mina. Louis. You're going with Louis. I'm going with Mina? Louis. Louis. <laughs> Mina, Louisville or Louisville? I just feel like it should be Louis, no? Louis. Louisville. Yeah, so we're all Louis, yeah? Let's find out from Daniel in Louisville. Huey, Dewey and Louis, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Which is it, Daniel? Well, if you are, are from here uh, in town, it's Louisville. L O or L O U H U H V U L. And for the rest of the world? For the rest of the world, I guess Louisville. Louisville. So well, we're, we're we're on the rest of the world's team, but I'll remember that whenever I'm in Louisville. <laughs> you got you got to visit the Ali Center, Don. And talk oh, about it. I'd about. love to. Actually, I genuinely would love to. And I've never been to Kentucky. Anyway, great to yeah, have you a, on. Brilliant place. Yeah, great to have you on the World Football phone in. And you've got a question about somewhere as far away from Louisville as you can imagine, football-wise or otherwise. Yeah, actually, if I could just say a couple quick things, too. Um, uh, as, a, as an Arsenal supporter here in the U.S., it was, you know, shocking. But I, I think my second, that was the first emotion. But second emotion was sort of relief that, you know, finally this sort of... Uh, uh, you know, is he coming? Is he going to stay? Is he going to go? It's finally over, and now you know Arsenal can really start to look forward and 
whoever the next coach is and, and really put a plan together. And now we can really spend the rest of the season just looking back on all of Arsene Wenger's accomplishments and all the great players who have played under him and all the great achievements they've done. And even though the club has kind of slipped down the last couple of years, um, you know, the overall consistency he had was, was very impressive and that, that'll, that'll always stay with me. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, Tim's favorite player here on the, the local team, Louisville City, uh, Cameron Lancaster, former Tottenham Academy player, won a penalty last week as the team uh, is now, I think, 4-0, 5-0 to start the season. So they're coming off a championship and they're, they're on fire to start the year. Um, but yeah, my, my question for... You're going to have to keep us posted. Now you've started that, Daniel. You're going to have to give us <laughs> updates on a weekly, if not uh, fortnightly basis on the Louisville... What are they call Louisville? Louisville City FC. Louisville City FC, yeah. Please keep us updated whenever you can. Whenever you can. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, my question was... Um, I, I grew up in uh, the New York City suburbs with a lot of uh, Italian-Americans, um, but none of their... You know, I, I, when I learned about kind of where they came from, it was, you know, southern Italy, a lot, a lot of people from Bari, a lot from Sicily, Palermo, that, that area. Um, and, and just recently I was, I was uh, thinking again, uh, you know, when you look at the at landscape in Italy and also in South America, you see that the at least at, at, at the moment, you know, all the football power concentration is in one area. So in Italy, it's, you know, in the north with Turin with Juventus and, and Milan and obviously a little bit with Rome and, and Napoli doing very well as well but you don't really, there, there's not a whole lot of power and money uh, you know in Bari or in Palermo and then same thing in Brazil, you know Hacifi, Fortaleza doesn't have a lot of uh, you know money or history or anything and I'm just curious if they can ever see a future where Sporchi, let's say, for, for Brazil ever wins, you know, the title, pulls a Leicester, or even just becomes, you know, power on, on the same level as Flamengo or something. And same thing for Mina, you know, if a team from the south, uh, really the true south of Italy, could ever become as mighty as Juventus or AC Milan. Let's take Mina first of all. Hmm. I guess money does play a huge part. Um... In all honesty, if you look at the way that Serie A is going now, the big challenger, the, or the, the, the ones who are in the top four, we're looking at Juventus. It's between five teams that are challenging for top four. So it's Juve, Inter, Roma, Lazio, Napoli. Roma, Lazio, Napoli, all Southerners. Inter and Juve, Northerners. So it's always been Milan, I guess, and, and Turin. You're right. That has been sort of where the power has been Weirdly enough, if you go to the south, if we are talking about Palermo, if you're talking about, you know, these types of places, you'll you'll notice that quite often they actually support Juventus. And that's because a lot of them at the time, the way that the landscape was, was that they would they were employed by the Fiat, by you know, the, the company Fiat. So they would all go north for their jobs and then eventually obviously support Juventus because that was the team of the Agnelli family. So it's it's funny how if you go into Turin, actually, they don't even support Juve. But right now, it's the South that's making the biggest noise in football. It's the, you know, the, the best derby to watch is, you know, other than Milan and, and Inter, because Milan has spent a lot of money, but they're still kind of already really not doing it under Montella. They're a lot better now with Gattuso. But right now, those are the teams to watch. Simone and Zaghi has done a tremendous job with Lazio, and I think they're just going to get better and better. If you're talking about Palermo and Cagliari, no, I don't think they're ever going to, they are, they're never going to be the powerhouses. Sadly, it's always going to be based on a city. I don't think it depends what the city is, but the problem with North and South has, it's not so much money, but really attitude. Um, with the South, they feel football too deeply. So it's almost a hindrance to them. And actually, Joyce Mertens, the Belgian winger, winger who's turned into a striker, was talking about that recently with a Dutch um, newspaper. And he just said it's really hard to live in Naples. You know, when he talks to, like, his team, you know, his friends who are in Juventus or in any other cities, he says, you know, they can go, they can take their kids to school, they can go for a coffee, they can go for a meal, and no one disturbs them. They're kind of anonymous. And Milan is so big, you can hide. But in Rome and Napoli, if they, you know, if you're Dries Mertens or you're Francesco Totti or you're whoever, Daniele De Rossi, you're not going to be left alone. Everyone wants to take a selfie with you. It's a hard life. If you're having a bad season, your life is practically over because everyone's going to know you. They're going to try to trash you. They're going to, 
yell at you from outside so you don't sleep. So I think that's more based on, you know, it's almost like where football really matters. And I just feel like in the north, perhaps you can just hide a little bit more, whereas you can't in the south. Although, Daniel, does that make any sense? Th- does that make sense for you, Daniel? Because you, you probably thought Rome was in central Italy, like a lot of us. But um, the... it is well, it is yeah, kind of the a, central, that's, that's but it's southern as well. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I was just going to say that, Don. That I, I thought Rome was in the center. I, I, I also feel like I got lost in Rome too. But I, you know, I guess with two big teams there, maybe, maybe it's a little harder if you're a player. <laughs> if you're Roma, honestly, you know how everyone talks about Napoli being like the city of football. Napoli is the city of superstition. Yeah, I mean, it's the city of magic and all of this. But Rome, if you are a football player, I honestly do not wish you to live in that city. Like, if you lose, <laughs> these fans are crazy. Like, you, you I mean, they're... <laughs> did, you saw what Palotta did when they when they won against Barcelona. He jumped into the, the, the fountain, the Del Popolo. Do you remember that? It was oh, just... Man. They're crazy. Like, they live it. It's so hard. You know, a lot of people talk about who my favourite ever coach is, and I will always, always say that I think the best ever coach that's ever lived or I've ever watched has always been Fabio Capello. To win... A title with Roma is the greatest achievement that you can manage because it is so hard. If you lose one game, your life is practically over. You cannot live. The trolls, the amount of abuse, the the <laughs> hatred. It, it's like you actually have to close and barricade yourself inside and pray to God no one comes and sees you, you know? Like, I mean, it's bad in Napoli. Don't get me wrong. When Iguani left, you know, there was his picture painted on all the toilet papers and he was the biggest betrayer of everything. Yeah. And Napoli is not that far off. But honestly, Roma, if you can win it with them, you are God. You are honestly God in my yeah. eyes. Well, the only problem with Fabio Capello was England. Yeah, well, that's what they say. They were yeah. like, oh, well, if he was so good, then he would have done it with England. You see, my response to that is not one that you're going to like, so I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> well, my, my, my response to that, my response to that is that my stepson, who works for the DHSS, had to do, you know, um, Fabio Capelli's, uh, you know, um, DHSS stuff when he came over here. Yeah, he had to say he got to meet him. He sat in a room with him, was taking all his details and everything like that. <laughs> did, did he say? Did, did Capello say England? England is is not in good moments because that, that seemed to be that, that seemed him. to be the line. Did I'll he ever ask say him. that? I'll ask him, is it just that me and my stepson don't talk very much because he's a gooner? Anyway, let's leave yeah. that to one side. But you know what? I just want to do something. You're yeah. right. Rome is central, so I guess you don't really count that, right? But if we're having to just decide if it's between only north and south, can we count central? Yeah, we can. Well, why not? Why not? Yeah. So yeah. then it's north, south and central, in which case then it's only the rest. In. Yeah, north and the rest. Yeah. Okay, but the South American aspect of Daniel's question, Tim, what about the north-south divide in Brazil? No, it's very, very pertinent. It's pertinent to the entire continent. The entire continent has this thing of centralisation. Uh, it's not just Brazil, um, where you know Brazilian football historically is centred in, in Rio and Sao Paulo in the southeast. And also, uh, the, the, the two sub-centres, uh, Belo Horizonte is southeast and Porto Alegre is in the south. So the north northeast really gets cut out there. Um, but so Argentina, and almost all the big teams are in Buenos Aires. Paraguay, they're all in Asuncion. Chile, they're all in Santiago. Peru, they're all in Lima. Uh, Uruguay, they're all in Montevideo. And there are, I think, two reasons for this. One is, is economic. Uh, and South America is, has, been, has been, if you like, economically, it's been raped. Uh, with you know the raw material just being taken out, taken out. So the, you get a dominant port through which the raw material is taken out, and the, the, the manufactured product made elsewhere is, is brought back. And that that dominant port, so uh, the, the the economy becomes like this huge head with an undeveloped body, uh, and that that big port city becomes all dominant, and, and that plays out in football as well. Another reason is that that also applies to Brazil to an extent, although uh, the original export crop from Brazil was in the northeast, it was sugar. Uh, then, you know, the late 19th century, by the time football emerges, it's coffee and coffee is in the southeast and that, that helps shift the, the economic balance down towards Sao Paulo and, and, and in Rio. But the other reason for this centralisation is media. Uh, unlike in our country, you know, in, in, in Britain, football developed organically before there was an electronic media. In, in South America, and Brazil as a specific example, radio played a huge role 
in spreading the game all across the country. And radio reflected this, uh, this centralization. So, you know, Rio, Rio was the capital at this time. So the radio is taking Rio games all across the country. So in those northeast regions, Recife is perhaps a little bit of an exception here, but in those northeast regions, um, Danny mentioned, he mentioned Fortaleza. Fortaleza is full of Flamengo fans. Flamengo's in Rio, thousands of miles away, but they've grown up on the radio with Flamengo games and now on, on the TV as well. So there's, there's, there's millions of people in that region who support Flamengo. And Flamengo are probably the most popular club in the northeast of Brazil. And you get that all across the continent as well. And Boca Juniors and River Plate in Argentina are national clubs with a national support base. So that, 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 that kind of reinforces the economic centralization, if you like. And that is further reinforced by the distribution of TV money. Now, clubs like Sport, uh, Sport Recife that, that Daniel mentioned, uh, they will complain a lot about how unfair the distribution of TV money is, making it very, very difficult for them to compete. So in, in, in the short term, especially now that Brazil has a league format, it's had it for the last 15 years, under the old playoff format, there was more space for a surprise team because under a playoff format, you've you got to hit, hit form at the right time. But under a league format, you know, there are 38 games over, over a, you know, a long, long season. The richest clubs and the best organised clubs will come to the surface, and that makes it very, very hard. So for the foreseeable future, you c I can't really see a team from the North East, a, a less traditional team, putting in a serious title bid. Uh, Daniel, can thanks. I, can yeah, I just on. say one yeah. more thing? Yeah, 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 I yeah. just texted my mum. <laughs> right. Is and she's a... She said, the reason I think that it is Roma is central, but the reason I think that is because they're the two most famous outside of Northern Italy. So your mum's listening to the World Football phone at this time in the morning. God, that's nice of her. My mum doesn't sleep. She doesn't sleep? No, but she's our Italian expert. <laughs> OK. Well, the next time we'll probably call her instead of you. Yeah, you know, probably. Mom? She might answer better. <laughs> <laughs> At least she won't wander off for a glass of water and or a cup of really tea. she's really sweet. <laughs> I don't and, she, and you that. won't understand her accent. <laughs> of course I will. Of course I will. I'll get Tim to t translate it. He, he, he does a good line in the phone. I don't speak Italian. Mi dispiace. No, 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 parlo. It's all Latin, isn't it? Mi dispiace. Anyway, this question, <laughs> this question and comment from from uh, Faisal in Birmingham, who says, Arsene Wenger will undoubtedly go down as not only a legend, a footballing giant and a great man, but also as one of the great revolutionists of uh, f or founding fathers of the game, alongside the likes of Jan Cruyff, Cesar, Luis, Minotti, Socrates, etc. As a gooner, I can safely say that Wenger has had an effect on me personally in how I view primarily football as well as elements of life and personal growth. If the message is too long, he says, you don't have to read this bit. OK. Aww. OK, let me move on then. So... <laughs> My question is, actually, let me read that bit, just for a laugh. Uh, stepping down was the correct decision given our grim circumstances, but for 20 years he touched our souls and wowed our minds with his knowledge of football, his class and human decencies, his charm, intellect and dedication to the point that you subconsciously appreciate and owe him a great deal of gratitude. That's an excellent tribute. So my question is, who else from the panel's regions was as influential as... Those listed, like Johan Cruyff, Cesar Luis, Minotti, Socrates, etc. Who else from your regions was as influential as them? Who else had an innovative and intellectual mind who inspired players, managers and opponents on a philosoph philosophical level and projected that philosophy and general wisdom of life on and off the pitch? Tim, do you want to go first? Well, it has to be. We, we speak about him a lot on this, but it has to be Bielsa. Marcelo Bielsa, the Argentine Wait, what coach. What about Tele who, Santana? Uh, go on. Well, perhaps. And, and, and Telly Santana was a, was a, was a terrific coach. The um, best. But, well, yeah, but all right. But one question I'm going to put there is where are his heirs? You know, what comes after Telly Santana? Uh, mm, and, uh, you don't really Sarri. find too many. Maurizio yeah, Sarri. Right, but in, Pep Guardiola. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yes, all right. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll have him. But, uh, you know, that, uh, 82 and 86, that, that, where Telly Santana was the coach, I mean, it's, it's the last World Cups until perhaps the next one, until this one coming. Maybe, maybe you, can, you, can, you can see Chichi, the current Brazilian coach, as in some way an heir of, of, of Tele Santana. Um, and he was, he was very successful with Sao Paulo in, in the early 90s as well, but not an heir. No, there, there aren't as many heirs as there are with Bielsa. And Bielsa is, will go down not, not for uh, titles that he's won, 
but for careers that that, that he has he has uh, influenced and and for the the, the, the philosophical approach in, in in which he in which he puts everything on. One of the very few people that Guardiola bothered to sit down and and, and uh, talk long and hard with before he took the step up to become Barcelona coach is is, is Bielsa, and there's a little bit of Bielsa. In, in what Guardiola does, which I know in part leads back to, to, to Johan Cruyff as well. But uh, Mina doesn't seem to rate him very much. What about Who, Bielsa? No, Cruyff. Sorry. We always, we always round. Oh, yeah. Us. Yeah, Cruyff, not that much. Yeah, okay, right. apart from Cruyff, who else in, in the European football would you say rivals those kind of people? A person who's revolutionised football, people always mention Pep Guardiola. Influential, influential as well. People always talk about Pep Guardiola, but for me, his football is a mixture of Enrico Saki and Tele Santana. So that's why I don't think he's revolutionized. I think he's taken two ideas and combined them and created something very special. But the man who revolutionized football is not one I particularly like, but he is obviously a legendary coach in Enrico Saki. He is total football. He created the great Milan side. And it was sensational at its time. I, there was this fabulous story in which <laughs> Madrid sent out a scout for a game that was going to be played between Saki's Milan and obviously Real Madrid. And they, you know, he had to hide and, and you know, sneak into training to see what was happening. And then he came back and they were like, so what happened? And he said, I have no idea. He said, I genuinely do not know what I just witnessed because there was no ball on the pitch. It, he, what he did for football is, for me, he changed the landscape. You know, it was really total football. It was... What he has produced is something special. As a as a man, I he irritates me greatly just because now he just gives us a I don't know because he he seems to really only like teams that play special football. It doesn't matter if they win or not. It's all about style. I'm obviously the opposite. I believe in trophies over style, but that's probably where we disagree. But he is revolutionized football. You have Johan Cruyff who had an idea. That's in one way I respect him is because he really believed in a special you know, style of football. And he, he is a revolutionary. He's not someone who necessarily just took an idea and sort of made it his own. So I do think he's revolutionary. Other than those two, Fabio Capello is probably a tremendous coach, but he doesn't have any airs. He doesn't have a particular style that I can always tell you that it's spurned a million people um, or a million followers. But I do think Pep Guardiola has inspired many people. And more than that, I think he's inspired nations and change the way that we look at football. Just based on it now, when we look at defenders, it's funny how many teams now want a defender who knows how to play with the ball. That wasn't something we necessarily looked for before Pep Guardiola came into the game. So he's changed a lot of things. Now people care so much about keeping possession. Now we care so much about actually, let's try to find a tactic that can really hit and negate his type of football. So now we've, you know, we're trying to find styles like Klopp's and Cholo Simeone's direct football or defensive football to try to counteract that. So actually, the impact that he's made in the last five years is huge for that reason. The way that we purchase players, what we look for in players, you know, the goalkeeper managing to do things is more than just shot stopper. You know, he has influenced the market, the the, the ideals, um, and to some it's negative, and but to most it's obviously very positive. You know, so he's probably done huge things and he's really changed the landscape. But I'm still convinced that his style of football is two ideas mixed together. Got a lot of jokes coming in. Mm. Eric in South Yorkshire says, who's Ian Wright going to talk to now that Veng has gone? <laughs> um, I really love Ian Wright. Yeah, so do I. That's just a joke, isn't it? Uh, Max, ready, yeah. Max says, all this Wenger brought nutrition to England is nonsense. Ask Gary McAllister and he'll tell you Howard Wilkinson was doing that at Leeds well before Arsene Wenger. Any I probably wouldn't be surprised. But what I also want to know is, you know, I mean, when people say Wenger revolutionised, do they say football or English football? Well, I'll tell you what, talking about that, and <laughs> talking about point. that, well, talking about that, Robert says, we, as in England, could have ruled the world if Wenger didn't stifle the footballing genius of Jermaine Pennant, Francis Jeffers, and David Bentley. Controversial. Do you remember Francis Jeffers, the fox in the box, as he was known as? Well, one of many, of course. 
Uh, you're listening to the World Football phone in. Um, why are you asking me about 25 Celsius? This is our editor tonight. He's talking and distracting me um, away from what I was otherwise going to do. Oh, he's coming in. Oh, hello. You bringing in another cookie in? You no, bringing... no, I can do if you like. Yeah, well, yeah. well, I mean, it's related to that, really. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to I mentioned 25 Celsius because that's yeah. what Lisa said in the news there. Yeah. Uh, and that's in be... London tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and obviously I realised that you're going to London tomorrow and I wondered if yeah. that heat was going to put you off the prawn sandwiches that they're going to serve at Wembley <laughs> when you go into the uh, director's box yeah. watch the FA Cup semi-final. I'll I tell you what, you take my <laughs> ticket then because I won't be able to make it, clearly. No, no, no. it's fine. I'm, I'm from Africa, I won't be able to take the heat. You I'm take just worried it. about those prawn you, sandwiches. You take it, That's you all. take my ticket. You from I'd Shrewsbury or wherever it is. Come on, Scunthorpe, please. Well, wherever. Do you want another cookie? Listen, I've just been learning. I mean, generally, now, don't take this the wrong way. Okay. Don't get it twisted, okay? I didn't know. I just, I genuinely didn't know that if you see a white person with a tan, it might be fake. How do you, I never knew. Well, I only do two colours anyway. I've got white and red and that's it. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's all I have. Okay, so. okay, okay. I, mean, I genuinely didn't know. I didn't you know, you know, I see a white person in their town. I'm like, hello, brother, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I learned that. I was, what a disappointment that is. Can I, I can only suggest you have a word with Tim because, I mean, literally, I, I mean, look no, but, at me. Yeah, but he, he's got one of those medallions on his chest. There's no point in having a word with him. He, well, he I can't even see sunshine. Tim. I just see the light glinting off know, the medallion. Can I carry on with my programme yeah, now? Yeah, do carry on. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Do you want it. a cookie to go with the prawn sandwich tomorrow? You're the boss, mate. You're the boss. Ew. You tell me. You decide. That's what I have to live with, you know, guys. That's James Do you Wickham, eat by prawn the way. Uh, don't, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Mina, you know me. I'm all on point nowadays. Let's go to Alexandra in Egypt, though, where Marwan is there. Hello, Marwan. Hi, Dobson. Good to speak to you. Gosh, uh, sorry about that little interlude, but you have got a decent question on Europe and South American football. Love it. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, I guess my question is, um, uh, what can a nation or even a team, a continent, do to level up with the, the levels of football in Europe and, and, and South America? So, first of all, in, in the... The Club World Cup, uh, Europeans and South Americans play less games than other, than, uh, other teams from other continents because uh, they are more powerful, I think. Uh, so there, there's a big difference between them. Europeans or South Americans will win in 9 out of 10 and game, uh, 9 out of 10 times uh, out of these games with other nations from Africa or... Only 9? Only 9 out of 10? Only 9? Oh. Maybe more, okay. maybe 49 out of 50. <laughs> 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 yeah. But I try to scale it down because yeah. I, I live in Africa and of I. Uh, you're, you're a fair so, person. Yeah. You're a fair, yeah. yeah. So, what can a nation do, a continent do, even a club do to be competing with the top? Even a small club here in, in Egypt like Samoa want to compete with the big. Boys, it's really hard. Like even in England, um, smaller teams it's very hard to break into the top six. Unlike uh, in the past, like a, a team that's just uh, that has recently come up uh, from uh, the second division, like Derby County, winning the, the, the Premier League, it's unlikely to happen now. Um, it was, it was, it was Leicester City. Fans, it, think, it was Leicester yeah? City the men that won the Premier League. It was well, Leicester Leicester City. City. Yeah, this is City made it, but it was one off. You see, it will not, I don't think it will happen again. And I don't think it can consistently shift. The the, the shift between uh, uh, top six teams will happen often. Like uh, the four or three out of the, the top six, the current top six will go to 10th, 11th, and 13th, and other will come up uh, to, to those positions like Stoke or. Even in West Ham, I, I don't think. Um, I want to to know the opinions of uh, of both uh, Mina Brzezuki and uh, uh, and Tim about uh, about this. And what well, can it happen? Can it even happen? That any team, any nation, any continent to get on top level with Europe and even surpass it? I don't know. Or maybe the closer is Asia because they got the money, they got the project about the, the Chinese league and 
they've got a, a, a bit of money in it and they need some experience. I don't know, but I'm to, to, to hear your opinion about that. Yeah, um, I'll start with Tim first, because, you know, you'll remember the days, Tim, when um, it was anybody's guess who would win the uh, the English top flight, you know, in the days before the Premier League, first division as it yeah. was in those days. Yeah, and w- when you look at it, a plethora of teams won it. Derby County, as he said, uh, as Moran said, Leeds United, Everton, another year it would be Manchester United or Man City or Tottenham or Ipswich or wherever it might be. Uh, that kind of difference of or, or plethora of possible winners just isn't there anymore, is it? No, and this is a this is a tendency in all of the big European leagues. In fact, it's a tendency in in other big European leagues outside the Premier League, which is even bigger than it is in the Premier League. This concentration of talent in a in a small group of of clubs. Uh, I, I think we have to address this 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 question in a completely different way in terms of club football and national team football. But in terms of club football, it seems to me to be very, very difficult indeed to reverse this process. Uh, that, because of this, concentr- this process of concentration, uh, it seems to feed upon itself. You know, the, w- once you get a small group of elite clubs, they will more or less reproduce themselves because they're in the media all the time they're fighting for the titles all the time this makes them attractive to sponsors it makes them attractive to players and and you get this 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 movement where all of the world's best players they want to congregate in the hands of of those clubs how you can counteract that at club level i'm not entirely sure at national team level i think it's a different story because at least with a national team you have those players for life they won't be playing in your national league for very long, but you, you, you have them, and the fact that they will go, if, if they're good enough, let's, let's take a, an, a, uh, an example from, from Egypt, uh, of, of Salah at Liverpool. You know, he is picking up top-level experience with a, a club that's in the semi-finals of the Champions League. So, you know, Salah, when he goes to the World Cup with Egypt, needs to have absolutely no inferiority complex whatsoever. He knows he's on the level of, of, of uh, some of the great stars in the world game, and he knows that, 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 that he can produce. So, the, uh, um, the, the answer... Yeah, yeah, all right. Let, uh, the answer comes... Yes. All right. The answer comes in youth development. And what are you trying to do in youth development? And the perfect example here is Uruguay. Uruguay is a country of, of a population of little over 3 million. Uh, the domestic football, they used to be powerful in South America. They haven't been powerful for years. Um, the last time a, a, a Uruguayan club won the Libertadores South America's Champions League was 30 years ago. Um, they haven't come close since. Uh, there's, only, there's only one final, I think, in, uh, in, in, all, in all of that time. So um, Uruguay, at club level, they can't compete. They've only got 3 million. They haven't got a market. They're going to lose their best players. So how have they come back to football top table? You, e- Egypt's first opponents in the World Cup, of course. Uh, they, they, well, they've done it by having a project of identifying talented players. And the, 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 what, what they do in their youth ranks uh, all along, you know, under 15, under 17, but especially under 20. Under 20 is where, is where you're looking for these players to shine. And Uruguay have been very, very successful at under 20 level. But what they're doing is they are looking to identify players who are good enough to play in global football. Not just one, not just a Salah, but a whole team of them. Uh, so they are, they are not trying to produce players for Uruguayan club football. It's not good enough. You know, and that, that, and that, that's a comfort zone. So they are looking to produce players who are good enough to hold their own in top-level European club football, which means three things. It means speed of movement, speed of thought, and speed of technical excellence. So players who who can move around the pitch, um, who know where they want to move the ball to, where to position themselves, and who who are technically capable of doing that. You take those players and you groom them you develop not only their, 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 their footballing abilities, but you, you, give them, uh, you give them a real a, a real crash course, if you like, in the, the identity of the national team, in what they are representing. You build a bond with those players that means that even if they're sold abroad at the likes of 20, 
They know that when they're coming home, they know what they are representing. Be it Uruguay. Now, it's easy with Uruguay because Uruguay were the first champions. So, you know, Uruguay have that, that football tradition. If you're doing it for another country, you are representing Egypt. What does that mean? Um, and you, you, you drill them and drill them and drill them, and you've got them for life. And that's how Uruguay are going to the World Cup as, as a country who uh, some people are tipping to reach the semifinals. Now, a year ago, Uruguay looked to have no chance whatsoever. They, they looked like they wouldn't even qualify. But they've been able to completely renew the side because they've got a whole generation there that they've groomed from the under-20 level who've stepped in and totally changed the characteristics of the team. They've produced that. They've been looking long-term. So I think uh, that, that's the answer for countries like Europe. You want your, 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 like Egypt, you want your Egyptian federation to be producing in mass players, not for, not for your, your, your domestic league, but players who are good enough to do what Salah is doing. And then when you've got a team of Salahs, you've got a team game, you've got a team of talent, you can win, you can compete with anyone. But if we can go back to the club um, question, Mina, that Marwan was posing, if, if he's right, and he is right, I suppose, and Tim is right, when he says in European football, it's going to be hard to see how the sort of three or four teams that dominate in any league are going to be shifted from power. It's not It's not impossible if the finances were more equitable. OK, TV money aside, for example, Crystal Palace was given permission by the local council in South London this week, just a couple of days ago, to expand their stadium. It's only expanding by about 8,000 seats. But nevertheless, you can see how much more they're going to be. They're not knocking to... down the supermarket, are they? They're not knocking no, down no, the Sainsbury's. No, 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 no. the Sainsbury's will stay. The Sainsbury's will stay. But they're having like a, a five-tier side on their, or, 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 you know, one the of the Arthur sides Wake of the... Stand. I don't know which of the stands, but yeah. It's, it's one yeah. of the small, my more surreal experiences in football, being in the Arthur Wake stand with everyone around me sh- singing, we're the Arthur, we're the Arthur, we're the Arthur over here. Um, so I hope it's that one. I'd, I'd like to have well, more people being able, you know, able to I've get in I've told you before, sing, it's one Arthur. of the more surreal experiences for me in a football stadium watching Sugar Minot uh, singing, Bay out the bar! <laughs> for Reggae Sunsplash at Crystal mm-hmm. Palace Stadium once upon a time. But anyway, meaning the point I'm trying to make is just that if... if I'm foreign. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. I know, I know, but it was, uh, I said, me buy out the bar, and that's not even in English. It's in Jamaican. There you go. So you've, you've, got, you've got a good thing going, the pair of you, haven't you? Hey, my missus did some work with him, you know, and she had a good thing going with well, him right. as well that I don't like to talk about. Anyway, the... Um... <laughs> Marwan and I are really yeah, like. Yeah, okay, let's, let's get back on to the footballing questions. Yeah, because you've lost me. I know, I but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Look, you know, if the, if, if the smaller clubs are able to, you know, expand their support and get a little bit more money, etc., then they can compete, can't they? Okay, let me just ask one thing. Can I ask a question before? Sure, of course you can. Marwa, you mentioned a club in the Premier League, in, your, in the Egyptian Premier League, Samoha, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and they went from being in the second division to the, yeah. to the Premier League, well, the, your version of the Premier League. And yeah, yeah. that was largely because they are now owned by an Egyptian millionaire, no? Who's part member of parliament? Yeah, I didn't hear the last part. He's a member of parliament, so he's a, basically a millionaire. Yeah, is, that yeah. How, yeah. Is, that, is that the reason why they started to do all, all of a sudden really well? They were runners-up in 2014, no? I guess no, because he, he won the club well. The Samoa is, is a really well-run uh, club. But I think the, the politics around the football in Egypt is not letting them go to full potential like another, another uh, club that's struggling this season, um, Wadi Digla. And about that, there is a lot of centralization about uh, football in Egypt, in in, in Ahli and Il So this yeah. is the problem, I think. Yeah. But you don't think the money played a part? So you, you're basically saying money is a huge, right? Because they went from being really yeah. nobodies to all of a sudden being sort of a somewhat of a superpower. You see, money yeah, is a really hard thing to obviously escape. I know that. Yeah. Tim, I, I yeah, really I get think- your. Tim was talking uh, about Uruguayan and youth development, but I think why it's somewhat easier for Uruguay and their youth de- development as well is because this is a country with a winning pedigree. You know, when you talk about football, which nations have always been really big in football. When it comes to Middle East, if we're looking at, you know, North Africans have always tended to be better than their Asian counterparts in, when we're talking between Arabs. There is a winning pedigree in football for nations such as Iraq, for Egypt, for Algeria, 
um, they're somewhat better than, say, Morocco in football um, for some reason. It's country is it's you know they, it's what is passed through your forefathers. It is what you learn. It is what is the sport of your country. And if you are India or Pakistan, it's just not going to be something you're as you know obviously as interested in. So if we're talking about club football and in a nation that's already got a winning pedigree, then obviously money is a huge thing. Youth development is also a huge thing. But I also, it, it, is, it is about building a club properly and about going and doing a, things in the right way. And that entails so much more than just picking a really good coach and finding a guy who scouts, you know. If we're doing it by country, you look, just look at Belgium. They've done this thing where they've looked at all the players and they've given them passports to the ones that they think want, they want to represent the national team. And it's a process of, you know, let's, let's make it easier. Let's make you, you know, it's, it's so much harder, for example, to be, I don't know, Italian than it was to be a Belgian player. You know, you go to Belgium and you prove yourself and they want you to be part of the team. They'll give you the passport. You're Belgian. That's it. You're part of them, you know. And so for certain national teams, how that's worked out is for that reason. Also, if you look at Algeria and what they've produced, I mean, it's magical. Some of their players are just outstanding. You know, I mean, we've seen Zinedine Zidane, Karim Benzema. They're all Algerian. But the problem is, is they don't choose their national team to play for. So if you are a country and you're trying to develop and you know that you have a winning pedigree and you know how to create players and you have youth system on your side, you need those players to pick to play for your country. Turkey needs their players to pick their country. They need, you know, they, they would have needed Mesut Ozil to choose them and not choose to play for Germany. It's also about getting and identifying and making sure they're always going to go with their home side. But often with professional footballers, they want to be with the team that they think is going to win or one that, you know, they've, they've chosen to live in. So they feel now that they're part of it. And so that can also change the way that they are. You can obviously always give passports. You know, that's one idea. But for countries, it gets a little bit harder. For teams, I guess, if you are a little club, like Sassuolo, for example, in Italy, created Eusebio Di Francesco. They chose them as a, as a coach. And he was obviously fantastic. He moved to Roma, and he's taken them now to the Champions League semifinal in his first season. They decided to go for the younger youth scout at Juventus. They've got a really well run, a really great chairman who refuses to get involved, a wonderful owner with a lot of money who doesn't just pump it. He wants to raise the money organically. You know, they have a stadium. And it's just about trying to do things the right way, buying the players they can afford, looking at statistics, looking at, you know, habits, at diets, what they can change, creating unity. Look at Eintracht Frankfurt. I mean, Niko Kovac has created a group out of a team that has like 17 different nationalities within it, within it because he's focused on turning them into a German side that only speak German, but that are united in one, despite the fact they all come from different cultures, different countries. He's created this really great atmosphere within the dressing room, which is why Eintracht Frankfurt, it is where they are. It is trying to create that unity, making football really fun and not just necessarily like, this is why I say it's so hard to be part of Napoli and part of Roma, because just the pressure is so hard that you, you, it's just not fun anymore. It's not fun when you're constantly being like, you have to win, you have to win, you have to win. But when you can enjoy yourself and not care too much and go out for a meal with your, with your friends or, and not get disturbed, that's also going to help you. So for little sides, it's, it's obviously money, scouting, building well, knowing how to flip bargains, having a sporting director like Monchi would certainly help. Um, but for nationalities, I think most of the time it's believing in your players and hoping they choose your country if you're a country that has a winning pedigree. Thanks very much uh, for the question, Mary. Well, we'll go to Darren in Shoreditch now. And appreciate you waiting patiently, Darren. How are you? I'm OK, Darren. How are you? Been you OK? Very well, thanks very much. Are you a Gooner in Shoreditch? I am, yeah. I'm Arsenal fan, yeah. yeah I thought so. I thought so, because you've got a question <laughs> about that. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've got a question for uh, 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 Mina. Hi, Mina. Hi, how are you? I'm OK. Um, just to ask you, um, I think Arsenal should go for a more younger manager... And when you look at across Europe, especially like in Germany, you've got Nagelsmann at Offenheim and also a guy like Tedesco at Schalke, probably maybe three or four years I could see it maybe as an Arsenal boss. But the person I want to ask you about is Paolo Fonseca at Shakhtar. I think the way uh, they played in Europe and, and also the way that he's, he's, he's done so well this season, 
I think someone like him would actually be ideal for Arsenal in the summer. Um, what do you think? Really, so quickly? Um, you're right. I think he's been tremendous this season. How the tactics that he's deployed, just how much fun he is to work with. You can see there's a real affinity been between him and his players. Obviously, Shakhtar did really well up until they faced Roma. I think he is definitely one to look at, but I'm never going to be a fan of... This is oh, this is going to sound rude because I don't mean anything against the Bundesliga, but with certain leagues, such as the Bundesliga, it's very offensively driven. So there are certain clubs that can sort of take a punt on a certain... <laughs> that doesn't sound right. It does. It okay. does, actually, because... Does you it? Know, yeah, to me, it does, actually, because... Um, you know, if you think about the Liverpool manager now coming from the Bundesliga, he has a very attack-oriented uh, philosophy of playing football. And that weakens maybe the difficulty of the game when, you, when, when you're when you not concentrating on a defence that you can't penetrate or you're trying to figure out a way to penetrate the defence. Essentially, what Mina is saying is that the Bundesliga ain't up to much in terms of... You know, <laughs> no, it's just that... It's, I, I was going to use yeah. a stronger word, but I knew that you wouldn't. You're such a lady. It is, it, it, no, no, because I don't want to necessarily say what it is that you're thinking, because it's not... What, I mean, obviously, the Bundesliga has done so well, but there, there is a lack of balance there. And it is always about trying to find a new trick, you know, like, OK, if we can get a young coach, you know, like Nagelsmann came in, so maybe we can go for Tedesco because he's, you know, roughly the same age. Maybe he'll do something special. Also, in the Bundesliga, you're kind of guaranteed that Bayern Munich is going to win it. So there's also less pressure and you need to build. And it's about thinking outside of the box and it's about trying to do something new. But it isn't a league in which you come across several different styles of play. So for that reason, I feel like you can be a little bit one-dimensional at times. That's not to say. That's not to say that there's, they are bad. I think Tedesco, like you said, is going to going to have a great career, and Nagelsmann is going to have a great career too. But they are untested, so I wouldn't go for that yet. You know, and I think Fonseca is is true is the same thing. Pochettino, you could tell that Espanyol was tremendous because obviously of the fact that every year he was losing his best players. And still doing really well in the in a league that has Barcelona, Real Madrid, Valencia, Sevilla, and they're not just teams who win the Champions League. They're teams teams who win the Europa League too. There's a variety of different styles of football. There's balance a, a little bit more in terms of tactics. So you know, oh, this side's quite attacking. Actually, this one's quite rigid. This one's so there is a lot more of let's say differences for you to have to prepare against. And even then, he had to come and pay his dues and, you know, do the likes of Southampton before he moved to Tottenham and so on and so forth. I'm never a fan of just giving in. I mean, Seydorf is, if you just meet this guy, he is one of the most intelligent people you'll come against. But he was thrown into the Milan job and he is so smart and he obviously fails because it's, it's, the club is not there. It's not prepared to support him in the right way. It's too much, like too quickly. It's different if you're Real Madrid and you believed in Zidane, and even Zidane paid his dues by playing under, you know, sorry, sorry, being the assistant to Carlo Ancelotti, by being the the coach of the first team. I think you need to do that. And Shakhtar for me is not enough experience on your CV to handle a job like Arsenal, where there are egos, where there's a lot of like chat between the coaches, a lot of criticism, the press. It's it's the league where the whole, you know, everyone in the world speaks English, so everyone cares about it. It is, it is the, the, the biggest league in the world. It's I a big remember, jump. Yeah, too much, too quickly. I, I remember that song by the specials, too much, too quickly. And yeah, it's Johnny, exactly that. Too young. No, no, I'm a joking. Come on, Tim. Come <laughs> on. Come on. <laughs> I put that Sorry. on the penalty spot for you and you kicked it away well, yeah, into the stands, Because Mina, Mina won't get the reference. The stands. You know, so you, you, know, did, really you did a Dino <laughs> Ross on that one, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny in Rush Home says, question for Tim from a Rush Home Blue. What have happened to Marlos Moreno? When he and Gabriel Jesus signed oh, for Man City. I'm so sad I thought, with this. Yeah, let me finish it. When he and Gabriel yeah. Jesus signed for Man City. I thought he came with a better reputation. I know he got loaned to Deportivo, but I've heard nothing since. It, it's it's a really sad story. I think this one, uh, and he was fantastic through the back end of fifteen and sixteen. He, he just did everything. He won the Colombian League, won the Copa Libertadores, was getting into the Colombia side and making a difference there. And then City buy him. He's loaned to La Coruña. 
no, right. But, you know, the club have got no, no long-term vested interest in him. I never really liked this. This season, he's loaned to Hirona, who don't use players in his position. So he's, he's not getting any game time. Right, so what's he going to do then? He's going to come here to, in Rio to Flamengo, uh, and uh, the coach there is the Colombian Rueda, who was his coach when he exploded in Colombia with Atletico Nacional. Brilliant. All right, so he's got a coach who knows him, who trusts him. Excellent. What happens before the deal is signed, before the loan deal is signed, Rueda gets a bid to an offer to go and coach Chile. So, uh, you know, he comes over, Marlos Moreno comes over and he doesn't have that, that coach anymore. He's got a coach who doesn't trust him, isn't giving him any game time. Uh, and and it's, it's an absolute tragedy because there is a fantastic young player in there, but he's not getting any, any game time anywhere, which is making him despondent. So, you know, you, 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 then it becomes a spiral of despair. It's an absolute tragedy because there is fantastic talent there. Save it, please, someone, while there's still time. OK, uh, let's come back and talk more about the uh, questions you want to ask for the World Football Phone in a moment or two. 0808590693. still got half an hour to join us and talk football to Europe and South America and maybe even pay tribute or otherwise to Arsene Wenger. First for news and the best live sport. This is BBC Five Live. Up all night with Dotton Adebayo. And the World Football Phone in this morning is with Mina Rizuki, the Colonel, and the legendino Tim Vickery. Alan has sent me a tweet that says, look, Tim Vickery and Mina Rizuki, I'm afraid that I have the cynical view that the Wenger success of 96 to 04 was largely due to him inheriting George Graham's back four and the fact that many of the world's best players were French, whom he had easy access to buy. I'd really like both of you to ponder whether mm. he had a greater success uh, with French players or with South American players. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, we have got one question from Mina. This question is coming all the way from Ian in Adelaide, Australia. Hello, Ian. How are you? Oh, hello. Hello to all of you. I, I still say you've got the best football program in the world. Oh, thank you. It's very kind of you. It is true. Of course it is. But, you know, it's kind of you to say it nevertheless. <laughs> Never stop saying that. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's all due to our listeners, you know. It's not, it's not just, uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not all just down to me. Okay. Well, my question is for Mina, and uh, I wanted to know <laughs> what she thinks about the traditionally perceived lack of appreciation of the tactical style of Italian football by many Brits in the media and also those that I come across personally. <laughs> you noticed that, right? Oh, yeah. wind her up. That Re the EPL like the touch paper exciting. and retreat to a safe distance. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They just they the really EPL. don't rate it, do they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like you often get the comment that EPL is exciting and fast compared to the laboured approach of Serie A. I heard a pundit in Australia once called EPL triathlon with the ball. Actually. Yeah. Well. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really nice if someone actually knew how to do a, a tackle. Uh, sorry, how to do an, a nice interception in the Premier League, yeah, whatever, rather than just a foul. Whatever, but you know. Whatever. <laughs> which is, which is oh, the, that was, which, that is, was the, which is the oh, league that the world is watching at Johnson. the moment? Yeah, okay. Come on. <laughs> do you want me to? Do you want me to do a Serie A versus Premier League thing? Well, for, yeah, for I mean, Ian's benefit, I'd love to hear Ian, what you have to say. Ian clearly okay, would just, like you to. Let, say, let, so. Let's be very honest. Yeah, like exactly how is the Premier League based on only this season? I'm not going to go back further than this. Yeah, based on this season, the one where Manchester City has already won it. What exactly can you honestly say happened this season that you can say, yeah, this is the greatest league in the world? Let me explain, yeah? Manchester City have won it with exactly what kind of competition? Are we talking about Jose Mourinho's Manchester United side that has no pattern, no style of football, no understanding of tactics, complete changes in the squad almost daily? We have no idea where Pogba's supposed to be playing, whether Mac Marcus Rashford is allowed to play or not, where Martial's actual position is. You know, it, it, it's all over the place, yeah? So with that's Manchester United. Chelsea gave up in summer before the season even started because Conte didn't get, like, his thousands of players that he had requested. Big surprise, yeah? Arsene Wenger, well, that kind of, that ship sailed a long time ago. Tottenham, they're very good, nice and balanced. Don't spend money, mental issues. So exactly who were the challengers to Manchester City? What is it that we saw that blew you but away by Liverpool in the last funny, three months? Isn't it funny? You summed it up in, in the analysis of those top four teams. You summed it up. That's why this league is so magical. 
Because, Why? Because, because, what? because you have people who challenge for it. Because it, things so funny fall that, apart in our league. Things fall apart. And they don't fall apart. And then, and, but this and is you, the thing. This you, is what bothers me so much. And everyone sits there and talks about the Spanish league being so dull and so boring because it's always, always Barcelona and Real Madrid. And always I've been like, but you don't get it. They're not just good. They're better than anyone in Europe. So this is why the Spaniards and other sides can't compete with them. And do you know what they always say? You know, they always say to me, oh, that's such a silly response. Except that's what's being said about Manchester City now. They're so good. They're so good to have been trashed in, Man- by, in, in, you know, by Liverpool and the Champions League. Let's look at what happened in the Champions League, shall we? Mental fragility, Spurs were out. United lose to Sevilla. I mean, honestly, yeah. Liverpool could feasibly reach the final, have ne- having never faced a giant who's won the competition in the last 10 years. Yeah. And, sorry, who else am I missing now? Chelsea. I know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everyone was like, I mean, you know, like, like their performance against Barcelona God, was pretty see, good. I mean, I know they lost see, 3-0, but it was pretty good, yeah? So let's be honest, just Ian, based on that alone, it, it, I can honestly tell you, Sally, I nearly had two Ian, challenges in semi-finals. Ian, when you were um, asking Mina to break down the difference between the Italian um, Serie Wait, A and the I Premier League. I haven't finished, Dottie. Oh, she, she hasn't finished. Me. I'm no. And then, and then... She's just warming you're up. you're saying no, that. No. Yeah, yeah, but you're saying that, firstly, because I came on and I was asked to, to, do, the, to do the live commentary, right? So it was Spurs, you know, Juventus, right? 2-2 two, two first, first leg. And I was like, oh, I mean, Spurs just totally outplayed them. This is Juve. What awfulness is this? They don't know how to defend. Yeah, it took us 10 minutes to beat you guys. Okay, secondly, yeah, you're talking about the Premier League, but you should have seen what's being written about the, the Italian League by the Italians themselves. This, this was why Buffon went mad. People didn't understand the underlyingness of this because what he said is, I'm a Juventus player, but before that, I am Italian. So after Rome, Roma, and Juventus lost in the first leg by quite a big margin because we have indeed forgotten how to defend in Serie A. Gazette de los Sport called it an inaccessible planet is Spain. And nobody can reach the heights that they reached in football. And they are now just so far and above everything else. It's ridiculous. Cabello came out and said, oh, technique. We sit there teaching, you know, how to foul, how to do tactics, what formation. But really, it's about teaching our kids technique if we want to reach somewhere special. Second leg happens. What happens? Real Madrid and Barcelona are nearly knocked out by two teams that have a quarter of the budget that those two have. The quarter of the fit. I mean, maybe Juventus is a big club, but Roma, come on, yeah? Italian tactics, you know, we'll take your technique and raise your Italian tactics. And all of a sudden, culture became important. Why Buffon went crazy more than anything is he really wanted Juve to go in for the simple sake that Italy would have two teams in a semi-final. What do you think that would say about a country that couldn't make it to the World Cup but fight, did something in the Champions League. They wanted to carry the name of Calcio. I don't necessarily think Serie A is good, so I'm not here to defend that. I'm just telling you that I don't think the Premier League is that great either. Have you finished? Yeah, I just want to say La Liga is the best, but that's I it. You said you finished. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm that's over it now. Time. That's it. I, I'm not sure you are, actually, so feel free to, <laughs> to return just, to it. Anyway. It's just the there swan song of how Pep Guardiola is so amazing. How? Why? Based on what? Based on what? Like, I just would like to know why all of a sudden Pep Guardiola winning a Bayern, winning a Barcelona is just nowhere near what it means winning in the Premier League. As if, like, why? I don't get it. Who were exactly his challengers, the great Jose Mourinho, who hasn't understood where Ian, Pogba should be you started this. Ian, don't keep quiet. You started this, you know, after all we've done oh, for no, your I... country. After all we've done for your country. It's a rant. I'm going to try to shut up. <laughs> this is how I get into trouble and I get done, abused on social media. After all we've done for Australia. Come on, man. <laughs> Why did you start this? Why did you start this? All what have we done the to this? Oh, well. <laughs> oh, I kind of felt that Mina thought something like that, but not as much. Yeah. Um, well, the, now the you one know. Thing I, now I, you know. I should be now. Yes, thank you. No, well, I mean, the, the funniest the one thing, thing I wanted... Thing. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's in Bayern Munich all of a sudden, like, this world's famous excellent size. I mean, they've reached the semi-final again. 
by getting Besiktas. I mean, honestly, you know. <laughs> Jeez, she's gone from the English Premier League to the Bundesliga now. Watch yeah. out, Nigerian Premier League. We're coming for yeah, you. Yeah, because they honestly <laughs> thought Peter Bosch was the, was the great... Like, they came out and told me Peter Bosch was the greatest signing for Dortmund. And I just sat there saying, are you being serious? But it took him, what, 10 games? And then out he went, you know? Sorry. That's OK. Uh, you about to say in? Uh, no, I just, what I was going to add, and of course, kind of interrupted, is like, I mean, Italy itself has won four World Cup titles, and it's never really appreciated as much as, for example, of Germany's whims or Brazil because of their style. The technical yeah, style yeah. is not as beautiful. No, let's not forget the Netherlands. Yeah, they're, they're already up there with all their failures, but you know, they play pretty football. But yeah, pretty football is all that matters now. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, amazing okay. how Argentina is such an Italianate country. I mean, almost all the Argentines can they can can trace their roots back to Italy. Uh, I remember the first time I was in Argentina, I thought, why is everyone speaking Italian to me? Because they speak Spanish with a with a totally Italian intonation. But in terms of football culture, they can be so so different. I mean, one of my favourite football books it's by a coach called Angel Capa, who's a, a devotee of Minotti, who won the World Cup in '78, and is a, is a leading. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm just saying this to provoke Mina. So hopefully she's going off for a water break to cool down. Uh, and, uh, and Kappa says in this book, and Kappa is, is, a, is a romantic. He's been a successful coach in his own time. But he, he just, as a little aside, he said, uh, you know, uh, one of the negative, I can't remember what he's referring to. But he says, one of the negative things about football and open brackets, like most of them, it originated in Italy. <laughs> Close oh. brackets, you know. His name's Kappa, he's from Italy. And Menotti, th- 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 this, is, this is the point where, where Mina is going to get really, really angry. Because uh, Menotti absolutely loves Guardiola. And uh, he... he, he <sighs> Well, the, 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 the two of them, the two of them met a few years ago, uh, and uh, he said that he said to Guardiola, "You know, your achievements, Guardiola, are so great. You have reinvented football so much that nowadays even the Italians want to play." And there, I rest my case. Okay, you know, on this Pep Guardiola, I'm really sorry. I'm just not going to. I'm not going to sleep tonight until I get my piece out about Guardiola. Yeah, we're talking about a coach who in 23 European matches in the Champions League has won four or five times in away games. Only four out of 23. Forgive me, but am I missing something here? This is a guy who has literally spent now in two seasons, what, 500 million on his squad, two, two of the greats in each position that he has. So he can rotate at will. And his side gets smashed by the Liverpool Really comprehensively, to be very honest, yeah. It, 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 to me, it just never looked like they were they were even in it. I don't understand how, when he was at Bayern, again a great team, a winning pedigree, barely barely exhausted from their league because they walk it, yeah. And yet he gets smashed by by Real Madrid five nil, smashed by Barcelona five nil, you know, dumped again by Atletico in his third season, and yet he's still being hailed as a genius. I get it. He plays really beautiful attacking football. You know, he, he's so smart in the sense that sophistication when it comes to offensive football, really, he is something truly, truly special. But the guy has yet to understand how to create a side that knows how to have balance, how to achieve balance, how to defend, how to win the matches in Europe. And for me, you cannot hail a person to be one of the greats if he cannot do that. One of the reasons why I tell you Capello, for me, will, will, is, is a great coach, it's not because of this Roma title or Madrid or Juventus, because he also worked with Giants or whatever, or, or with big team players, but because he won against the dream team of Cruyff. Was it Cruyff at the time? I'm starting to forget now. 94, with a squad that was yeah, barely was. there, with, with, his, with his back line barely available. They were either injured or suspended. Savicevic is what he had up top. This is... This is really making do with what you have and producing something. If I turn around and say to you, you know, I can really do my job. I can do the best job in the world. I can, I can be Donald Trump. I can gi- give you the greatest economy. You just need to give me 700 billion. No, I'm sorry. The least that he can do is win this league. So the fact that he's being hailed as a superstar, I find it a little bit strange. You can always admire his attacking football. It is truly special and he deserves that. I don't know how he's being considered a genius. I don't understand it. Mina. 
as sorry. No, 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 no. My rant is over. No, no, no. It's not over. No, it's not over. It's never over. <laughs> it's really not over. No, it's every, really funny. Every time you say it's over, over, I just lean back and wait for the next round. But what I was going to say in a Shakespearean way is, Mina, is this not better than groaning for love? Now art thou sociable, now art thou meaner, now art thou what thou art by art as well as by nature. For this driveling love is like a, a great natural that runs lolling up and down to hide its bauble in a hole. Mercutio will say anything if it means that you compare your enjoyment of the World Football phone in with... <laughs> your podcast and we're saying to you, do you ever have as much fun as this no. in your podcast? You see what I mean? Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, we, we got to that. Uh, we came to an agreement on that very quickly, Tim. So I think we can move on now. No, I really do enjoy okay. it, but just because this I have the, I always, the space to rant. This is why I always <laughs> tell you to quote Shakespeare, Tim. You know me. Anyway, this is from one of our yeah, listeners. Well, the, the, the bard hit the nail on the head right with that one, didn't he? Well, funny about the bard, because, you know, we have our own bard. You know, bardy? Uh, uh, Sarah? Do, yeah. Sarah, yeah, yes. He always sends us uh, a text or email, off, off, often with a little bit of humour to it. Anyway, uh, Sarah says, this is my favourite show, as always, but I know that the era of the cup final songs seem to have passed, but with Chaz and Dave, remember them, Tim? Uh, with Chaz and Dave, you mentioned them earlier, so you shouldn't have forgotten them by now. <laughs> not, unless, not unless age is getting to you more rapidly than I thought. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but with Chaz, I'm sorry, but with Chaz and Dave admitting that they have a song ready to go if Spurs reach oh, the yes. FA Cup final, yes. it, hang, on, yeah. hang on, it made me wonder if cup competitions in other countries have such strange traditions or rituals such as, um, you know, a football song being written and dedicated to their appearance in a final or anything like that. Anything like that in South America or not? No, not really. First of all, the, 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 there are more countries now with domestic cup competitions, but it, it, it really isn't the same. You know, it's quite often new competitions and, and, and part of the FA Cup is that history that it has on first, you know, the history going back to 1872, or when I think it started in 1872, but also that history that, that our generation, Dot and Remember, you know, when it was the only live game, the only club live game that you ever got on TV. So it was just huge. You know, the coverage, the game used to kick off at three and the coverage would start at seven o'clock in the morning and yeah. you got an it's a knockout. Yeah, and you got, yeah, and yeah, you're that, right. that just you're made right. the event you're right. so huge. And it was much more glamorous yeah. than winning the league. Was, was playing in the, and, in the cup final. And, you remember, and waited, you, come, sorry, go on. You remember come the end of the game, everyone was going down with cramp. Everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah, and there was all the yeah, yeah, Wembley yeah. sapping turf. It was nothing yeah, yeah. to do with Wembley <laughs> sapping turf. It was just the, you know, the mental pressure of playing it was, uh, was, was taking the, 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 the muscular strain yeah. up, to, uh, up to another level. And, and this, and maybe when we talk about Guardiola winning the Premier League, and, and maybe it's that, that wealth and uh, the wealth of, of, of English football culture, the fact that so many teams are, are represented in England, the fact that we do have these quirky little traditions like the, the FA Cup final I don't know why so the, that, that, I it, don't It's know all why part the, of it. Well, the best part of the FA Cup, as it was from people of my generation, Mina, uh, was when around midday, the, with all the cameras there, like Tim said, the, the coverage started very early in the morning. You'd wake up early, you know, uh, mm. on a Saturday morning, which was your, your lying day if you went to school. You wake up early to catch every single minute of the coverage. Paper boy, no chance of that. Well, there you go. <laughs> At least you got your 50p's worth. But, you know, you, you, you wake up early to catch every moment. And then about midday, the best bit for me is they turf out the two teams onto the turf at Wembley uh, to just basically for a photo shoot in their suits, the suits that they'd all got especially made for the occasion because they'd all wear the same suit. And so you'd like to see which one went to John Collier, John Collier, the window to watch to buy their suits and which ones went to Burton's. Essentially, that was the best bit. Do you not remember that? John Collier, John Collier, the window to watch. Yeah, we loved all that in those days, mate. It's good old days, good old days. What about, what about this one? I hope you guys are having a great day. Yeah, uh, clearly we are. Uh, 
So yeah. with Arsene Wenger announcing his imminent departure from Arsenal, I was on. Um, I wanted to ask the guests in their regions: Is there a manager or coach who has been equally revered and reviled in that way? Can you think of anybody in Europe, Mina? What, who's loved and hated? Are yeah. those synonyms? Yeah, 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 basically, yes. <laughs> loved and hated as synonyms, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, yeah, Rigo Saki is one. Rigo Saki, um, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, he's obviously loved because he revolutionised uh, football, mm. not just Italian football in general. You know, what he did with Milan is something that I think everyone will remember. But a lot of people took issue with him when it came to the national team. The number of people he called up, the fact that he seemed to just cut uh, Roberto Baggio out after that, that penalty miss, the way that he handled himself, you know, thereafter, some of the comments that he's made. And so there's... He is loved by a lot of people, greatly respected by many, but I would say Marcelo Bielsa is one, is one of those. I don't know as well, but I feel like he's got a lot of fans. Choose one. Choose one. Out of Bielsa and Skaki, which is the one that was most reviled? <laughs> Did you call him Skaki? Oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's got, got him mixed up with an English actress of <laughs> Italian origin, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Jose love. Mourinho. I'm uh, going to pick Jose Mourinho. Are you going to pick Jose? <laughs> Out of those two, you're going to pick. But it's, it's all, it's all for the Greta good. Yeah, I'm very good. For it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Because even I you got knew, it. You knew exactly where my mind was going on that one. But anyway, <laughs> moving on very swiftly. What about in South America? Somebody oh, I was going to go with um, the former national team coach and the former Real Madrid coach, Vanderlei Luxemburgo who is a man uh, after Mina's heart, because a couple of years ago, he said, you know, he said, he said, this Guardiola, you know, he's not much of a coach. It's all marketing. It's all marketing. So, uh, you know, Mina will be trying to try hire him for, for, for Juventus okay, now. Just, just uh, but he this, has... has he found the blueprint of how to overcome direct time? Just, honestly, just play direct football against him and he'll, yeah. he'll pass out. He had no idea how to defend against well, it. Well, he's never proved he can looks... do it. <laughs> Van der Luxemburger hasn't found any blueprints, print but he's found some macro plans. I remember mean, well, when he took over the Brazil side in, in 1998, he was, he, he's a fascinating character. He, he's got no sense of his own ridiculousness, you know, which, which, makes him, which makes him endlessly fascinating, I think. And at the time, he had just swallowed all... He'd, written, he'd obviously read a few self-help books and business stuff, you know, and he just swallowed all of that jargon. So that's all he would talk about in the press conferences. He would say, they would ask him, you know, what are, you, what are your plans for the Brazil team? He said, well, well we're going to sort out our macro planning first, you know, and all of this psycho babble. It was obviously absolute nonsense, but it's part of the thing that made, makes him makes him quite a fascinating figure. Uh, and uh, he, he, it looks like he might have gone now. He, he, he's, he's, he, he hasn't had a job for the last few months. He's, he's, he's sometimes he's in the frame for this job or that job, but he does wind a lot of people up. Um, and and he, so he, he's, a, he's a kind of love him or hate him figure. Mm. You know what? He's a good coach. It's the Monaco one. Yeah. Uh, Hadim. Like, he's so mm, underrated. Portuguese, I don't know why uh, he's never get mentioned for big jobs. I mean, mm. what this guy's done for Monaco. But, you know, he doesn't have the branding that Guardiola does. So. Oh, gosh. It, <laughs> seems, it seems almost a shame uh, to move on from Greta Skaki. But anyway, if we must. <laughs> <laughs> Seems almost a shame, doesn't it? <laughs> I've never heard you laugh so much, Mina. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> See, I, I, I think she'd been on the sherbet before she joined us tonight. I think she said he needs a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> Probably needs a, an asthma pump as well. I, we, I genuinely don't drink. <laughs> no, okay, you enjoyed that Sorry. one. You enjoyed that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you can dine on but that just, one for just years. Ask to come. people what they think okay. or if they agreed with what I said okay. or not, or whether no, I've just sure. gone crazy about Guardiola. No, no, you've enjoyed it. Uh, Dan in London says, could Mina elaborate on Lazio's league improvement and the role played by the much maligned but quite loved, again, loved and hated, Lucas Lever, his performance in Italy has stunned Liverpool fans. Does Tim think there's any chance of seeing him at the World Cup or is the Brazil squad too no. stacked with talent in midfield? OK, and Mina, where, can you elaborate on the on Tremendous the coach. He really understands how to communicate with his players, but he's also got really great coaching staff and he's 
you know, he's, he, for example, he noticed Lazio didn't do well against Empoli, so he hired one of the coaches from Empoli to help him create tactics. Lucas Leva, uh, Leva came in to replace oh, no, uh, not another Belia, Belia at the time, <laughs> and he just he just slots in players into their yeah. roles, and they do they do such good Look, work, offensively Tim. best side in, in let's, Europe. Let's now. get Tim yeah. to tell us: is it Leva or Leva? Lever. Lucas Lever. It is Lever, is it? <laughs> so I got that wrong as well. <laughs> it's just because you can't get over this guy, Keith. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're just anyway, pressing yeah. all the wrong levers oh, no, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're too good too. I can't match that one. I'll get you back next time though. There's always two legs to every world football phone in, you know that. You got the first one. I'm gonna I'm be like Tottenham after the first leg against I'll... Juventus. So well, I'm swagging around, I'm gonna I'll, be brought I'll, down to size. I'll tell you what it was like going to Wembley to see you lot lose against Manchester Please. United next week. <laughs> Uh, no, Mina. we want a Chaz and Dave song out there. <laughs> Mina, thanks very much, Tim. Many Thank thanks. <laughs> yeah, see you later. Cheers, thanks. BBC Five Live.